Well, we are here today with my dear friend, Rachel Yard, who is Miss Patience herself, because we have had all kinds oh, of struggles trying to get this, <laughs> this interview done. Is it important or what? Yes, it is. Yes, it yes. is. So Rachel, thank you so much. Very well. Understanding. Thank you for your time. Rachel is first and foremost a follower after Jesus, and she is making a difference all the time through her ministry called Throne of Grace. She is just an awesome wife of many years to Danny and mom to three incredible kids. And I just um, have enjoyed walking alongside you and seeing what you're doing through the years because we've known each other for quite a while. I mean, it's uh, what, more than 10 yeah at least uh, yeah 15, i hate to say how many longer. but yeah <laughs> however old charlotte is when i first saw you she was a newborn in your arms okay that's eight eight almost 19 18 years yeah yeah but not that we're right. getting older or anything no, our kids uh -uh. are but we're, we're we look 19. the same <laughs> we're at our prime we're at our prime right yeah we just get so, better um just real quick i want you to talk about yes. yourself go back to the beginning your family, where you grew up, all that. Okay. Um, I was born in Fairbanks, Alaska, because my dad was in the army, and we lived there about nine months, and then we moved back to their hometown of Illinois, and from there, um, they live in a little town, Kankakee, Illinois, and then we ended up in Ohio for several years, so I was about four years old, and then uh, moved to California. So since four, I've lived in Southern California in my life. So I kind of feel like I've lived here most of my life. Well, all of my life, but minus those a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, raised in a Christian family with mom and dad present and involved and, um, you know, busy life and everything. But, but had that influence there, it was important to be at church. It was important to understand a relationship with Christ and um, was given good tools for that moving forward. Um, and that's been a blessing to be able to grow up like that, but that was my beginnings. <laughs> awesome. With a supportive family with, you know, mom and dad in the house, um, what was your childhood like? Was it stable? Was it family centric? Do you feel like you had a pretty good childhood? Yes. Yes. Um, I feel like it was very stable, very family focused. We, I, my mother and I had a, have still a, a very good relationship, close. She was my best friend for the long, you know, somebody I could speak to all the time and felt safe with is my father too. He worked a lot because that's what needed to happen, but he was there and present, very loving and engaged as well. So um, I feel like I had a great example of parents and marriage growing up. Mm -hmm. um, Granted, they came from a small town in the Midwest, so it's different in Cal. You know, growing up in California is different. I'm going to see a lot of it, especially California. It's kind of a small pocket of special, but um, yeah. So, but anyways, yes. Ultimately, that was a great example, and I had a we had a very close family. All my I have a younger brother and a younger sister, and all of us, you know, with the normal sibling business, but we all got along and enjoyed. Um, being a family for and you were a church going family as well yes it's like yes. some sort of form of faith all the time yes uh -huh. church was important youth group the whole the whole thing mm -hmm. um camp you know all that fun stuff would you say that you were a fairly confident outgoing well-adjusted kid yeah i don't know i mean um confident in just who i was i was more of a quiet person and if i didn't know people i wouldn't really say much that's just personality mm -hmm. it's changed and grown obviously i could care less now but when i was younger that was a that was a problem I mean, i would make friends of course but it would be uh, i could count them on one hand and they were very good friends and mm -hmm. you know we kind of relied on each other because i think it has never been a good thing for me i don't enjoy lots of people because they just know my name i would rather have good friends that i keep mm -hmm. close so yeah not that i lacked confidence but but it wasn't um, fearful of. Well, I have team. yet to find anybody like in junior high age. Who's <laughs> right. Absolutely confident. I don't care how right. well you've been raised. Right. I mean, things yeah. are growing at an alarming rate, and your feet are too big, and your nose is too big, and, and my brows. What do I do with yeah. teeth? And my teeth are doing. <laughs> I have right. no idea how to primp or do my hair, and I'm just you know it's the ugly yeah. duckling thing. Just it, trying it, to match. That's all. Just trying to match. <laughs> <laughs> French right. socks, same color. Granite, yeah. yeah, back then it was, you know, great, all colors, all kinds of crazy. But yeah, 
Uh -huh. Well, just to dive into our topic, when did yes. you first hear about sex? From whom and what circumstances? Yeah, I, and I don't remember the exact. I think it just kind of over time, several conversations, obviously it was an open door to talk to my parents, mostly my mom, you know, and if I had questions I would ask and she would answer. Um, and at that time, 50 years ago, less than that, maybe, you know, 45 years, whatever, however old I was when, I, when they did classes at school, but we would learn about the basics of human biology and what happened, you know, to make you, you know, the, the difference between the male and female and how a baby was made and all of that, but that was kind of it, you know, they didn't get into the how-tos of things, um, so not really a sex discussion, but then based off of that, of course, kids speak, and there's always access to stuff more now than there was then, but so probably the first time I thought about that or talked about that was with friends, I would think, peers. Um, but any of the questions that I had, I could ask. And I felt like that was answered as needed. And my mom didn't shy away from the topic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also in the sense that it, in her perspective, that topic wasn't really as open as what I was being presented with, maybe with people and, right. and whatnot. So her answers were what she had, her knowledge base, her ability to share on the topic. Um, and she did a great job. I don't blame her at all for anything mm -hmm. that I chose later. <laughs> that was, right. that well, was me. Something, something that I find interesting is that um, even many of the people I've talked to on, you know, for my book, Great Love for Life, many of them, I think, tend to point to this happened, I was molested, this happened, uh -huh. we didn't have a father in the family, or my father was okay. very angry, or a drunk, or um, we moved so much, and it was really hard to make, you know, there's something that kind of pushed them toward mm -hmm. the choices, and I okay. see your case is interesting, because we don't always have to have, this was negative, this was negative, this was negative, therefore, I fell into it, or I was forced right. into it, um, right. because, you know, strong-willed kids are great leaders, but they're also tough to, to raise. I've had a couple of those myself, and it sounds like you were one of those, that you were just strong-willed, intelligent, knew your own mind. I mean, maybe you can talk about that a little what bit. What I thought at the time. Right. Yeah, there weren't any great things that happened to send me down a path in one way or another. You know, I didn't have any devastating experiences or lack of parental, you know, involvement or lack of the father or any of those things. I, I feel like sometimes, well, it, it could, be, it could be either way. You can have an event that happens that leads you to, to make choices that are not good for you, or you can have a great family <laughs> and yet you can still make choices that don't line up with what should have been there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I don't know why one or the other happens. Obviously, it has something to do with personality and kind of maybe headstrongness. But um, for me, it was knowing full well the difference between things. And I think I was kind of used to the Christianese or living a life like that. That was just here. That was kind of autopilot. But when faced mm -hmm. with something, I didn't really connect. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. It's just what I know. But that's not really who I, you know, I didn't connect it with who I am with my actions. So... Or I felt like it, it you know, this will be okay because I don't know, I just didn't really call it, give it a hard line. Mm -hmm. um, I did what I wanted to do or what I thought I would want to do or not necessarily what someone else would want me to do. I really just made my own choices about it mm -hmm. um, and, and liked this, the way it felt, like the sin that that was a mm -hmm. part of. So I chose that for that to be okay for me. Well, I, I like this point of view because I think often as parents, we can flog ourselves to death right. if something goes wrong, if someone makes a choice, mm -hmm. but we need to remember, you know, I always kind of go back to Lucifer was created by God. He knew God's love. Greatest father yeah. in the world still mm -hmm. chose to rebel. And I mean, our kids mm -hmm. so many times, they just have to go through that season of making their own choices. And then, you know, honestly, I do believe that when they're older, they're going to, you mm -hmm. know, follow what's right and go with how they've been raised. But, so did you feel like uh, your church experience did much to prepare you for all of this? I think the church experience was very rich. Um, we, we went to a Lutheran church, but even saying that, not 
the entirety of my youth, but for a bunch of it, but it was very Christ centered mm -hmm. biblical teaching. You know, as it, there wasn't a hang up on things that didn't have meaning. It, it had meaning and had presence. And so the youth group was very, um, current and you know we, we did activities and the messages were great and engagement was great and there was still instruction on obviously you know things that lined up with godly principles it was there it was present i still i don't really know where the disconnect happened for me but i maybe it was you know heart head knowledge versus heart knowledge i mean i felt like i'd made a decision to to give my life to christ when i was in high school um but I had never been tested in any of those things. It might have been areas in my life where Satan knew I might have weakness. You know, I, I hadn't been to those places yet. So right. when I was confronted with them, without having that solid bedrock of conviction, it wasn't hard for me to be, well, that's separate from what I, you know, like I can do that. It's not going to be a big deal and right. justify my actions. Well, so how old were you then when you started dating and having boyfriends and the real first real boyfriend was probably uh around first year of high school and 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 i didn't have sex with anybody till i was out of like that was in first year college and situation like that i mean i really thought i was holding the line because that was not happening but what what really needs to happen to cause you to share that intimacy of yourself with someone else it's not only intercourse there's a lot of other things that connect you to another person mm -hmm. and so you know i had well i'm still good at that i'm so good girl i mean you know you know whatever so that that sort of compromise began probably about my first year of high school and then it just was kind of a slippery slope where the next step was really easy to take when it came did you, you know, what were your basic hopes and dreams regarding love and marriage and all of that when you were a young girl? Um, hopes and dreams for a, a marriage that would be something I would do would last forever, you know, would last for my whole lifetime that I could have that sort of a commitment with somebody that I loved and loved me. And as a young girl, I didn't really know what all that entailed. You know, how do you, what does that mean? A commitment. I did, wasn't even thinking about the hard times that you have to go through, none of that. But ideally, of course, I wanted to be married. I wanted to have children and live happily ever after. You know, that was my dream. And of course, I knew the way to do that was to not jump the gun. There was a, You don't want to give something away. In my mind, in a kind of a twisted fashion, I knew that the person I wanted to marry would should be the person that I first experienced sex and intimacy with because that's the design that god has i knew that enough and so when i got close to the boundary line of of experiencing that outside of marriage i tried to make it okay by doing it with the person i thought i wanted to be with rather than the person i was just joking around with you know and so it made this sort of weird logical process that so that i'm still okay with the person that i really want to be you know it's just it's a strange justification you gave yourself to him first therefore because i wanted to be right so it was still one. close yeah it was mm -hmm. still sort of the right way you know kind of thing. well how did how did that relationship from high school it didn't up? didn't last it it was on again off again for years actually um first year of college and then i was in a situation with another young man which led to my getting pregnant and and having an abortion and then after that re re-engaging re with this other guy um coming clean being honest about who i was and what was going on and, and it, it seemed like a good relationship at one point he had given his life to christ and I thought, okay god you know make this work and it just was off and on just uh ultimately did not work and i look back now and i'm so thankful you know you pray for making this but you know and and i i wouldn't change it I wouldn't change not being with him. I'm actually very glad that that didn't work. Just this is too much there. Maybe you can kind of talk about that, how that, how that presented itself, what drew you to that person that you were just quote, having fun with. Right. Um, I think it was being somebody giving me attention in a way that I hadn't really experienced before. For one, um, he was a very, popular with the girls very high profile basketball player and mm -hmm. and he was interested in little me you know and i was different from the other girls and the other things in the lifestyle and all of that and yet it was it was one of those things that 
he recognized the difference and, and, and felt, you know, kind of held me in a different place, but yet the behaviors were the same. I mean, what was his expectation was the same. It wasn't like he made me do anything. Obviously I was there for the ride. Um, but I think the notoriety of that was pretty neat. And also mm -hmm. just, it made me feel different. Like, wow, you know, that's kind of cool. It made me feel special. Maybe that he wanted my attention and wanted a relationship with me. And so, um, and you know, genuinely so, like not one of a number, which is kind of how it had been. So uh, that's what what drew me in. And you know, even people around me were like, "Why are you bothering with this person?" Well, you know, and I'm like, "Yeah." yeah. <laughs> so it feels good. I feel yeah, important. Exactly. I'm liking Leave the attention. Leave yeah. me alone. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and I didn't. And um, after it all said and done, and and didn't work out. Um, I heard later from his brother that he was devastated by my not having anything to do with him anymore and how, how much that had all damaged and hurt me. And we'll go on, into on, the on. circumstances. What, what devastated you? And so what you so a little bit into relationship with him. And I think it might've been the second time we ever were ever had sex. I was told that I should go wash up because the condom broke and I, was very inexperienced and what do you why were you more careful i mean for a long time i was i realized i was angry about that like you knew you knew better than i, I wouldn't be able to know that and yet you didn't bother to stop like you just needed to hello you know so yeah. uh so yeah so i knew instantly i'm like well okay no i just knew that i was gonna have to deal with being pregnant that's just wow and sure enough i was and um it was kind of his mo if that was the case that i'll just take it to get an abortion and i i was actually desiring that because i knew already remind you i knew going in what was okay to do and not to be doing and all of this so as i processed what was going on i can't tell my parents no way they've never trusted me again my whole future's just started in front of me i can't be a mom right now i couldn't tell you know all of these things i would disappointment you know whatever and um so i actually was in the state of mind to hate what was going on in my body which is so wrong but that's the only way i know there's the only way that i could have possibly gone through with that process it was kind of like a me watching me do this thing it wasn't really and that was because i knew it was wrong i knew that this was a life i knew i'd be killing my child but i couldn't touch base with any of those things it just wouldn't right. so anyway um after the fact it it was like well i can't i i walked away from the relationship from him it was too much um, there was a moment of complete remorse and regret and brokenness um and then you know we have good defense mechanisms so that got all covered over and I said I'm moving up and never saw him again and uh saw his brother I don't know a year a couple of years later and he was like what did you do to my brother I said I didn't do anything to your brother you're talking about it's like he is so broken he is still devastated I don't know what you know like so the difference in somebody being a run-of-the-mill is kind of how you handle pregnancies versus this person he thought was a little bit different coming in I feel like I was a different kind of girl than he was used to being around mm -hmm even though I didn't really act any different, uh, it, it woke him up a little to the, to the nature of what was going on. Cause it if hurt. If you had to guess how many me. times do you think he had probably had that situation come up? I know for a fact with one particular girl, at least five times or more. And that's just one. It may be even more than I'm trying to remember. Yeah. And she was a mess. Like she'd still call while we were in our, you know, and he'd be like, oh. you know, but, but why? Because she's devastated. She's mm -hmm. devastated. I didn't know that now, but yeah. So hopefully it opened his eyes to what really goes Your on. Your choices and how, have repercussions. And how much it is, this is hurting the person that you are just not really thinking about in that mm -hmm. fashion. Right. How can you say you love someone when you're really not protecting them? Yeah. Protecting yeah. their future, protecting their right. self-worth, all of that. Right. Um, yeah. So you dated him for how long? Just a year that I was at that school, mm -hmm. first year of college, and then I moved back home, um, mm -hmm. finished up, and then transferred to another school and mm -hmm. finished my education. Um, but it led me, you know, I didn't come to grips with 
what I had done. I hadn't really opened that box. I put it away. I dealt with, you know, I kind of dealt with my demons, as people like to say, and uh, didn't even really acknowledge, didn't really ask for forgiveness. It hadn't hit home quite like that. And um, within the next five years, though, God did a lot of work on me, and he, well, first of all, my choices went down the other track, like very promiscuous, very um, sexual prowess. I'm going to, you know, this is a strength I have. This is something I can do. And and I surrounded myself with people that enforced that in me and encouraged, mm-hmm. oh, what you did was fine. You know, it's totally your right as a woman. All of those things. Um, and I I lived that way when I went to this college as I went you know, went to finish my schooling, I was very involved in the pro-choice movement, very active writing poetry for their displays, mm-hmm. um, going to the club meetings, it's my body, talk things, you know, <laughs> it was me, and I, I've asked God to forgive me for what I have spoken during that time, but I just wonder, and it breaks my heart to think about who listened to me, who heard that and said, okay, I'm going to do it because you told me that was okay. And it's because it's not. So within a period of about five years from having had the abortion, uh, God got a hold of me and changed that. Mm-hmm. So, wow. But that was all during the course. So you first felt remorse about the whole thing about, I mean, you probably felt remorse at the time, but then really. Yeah. Initially, to... right after I did, you know, you deal with that a lot. Most women will say that that's very common. There was sort of this moment of realization and then it quickly gets it, to so survive like to and move that? forward. Do you feel you like must... you tried to replace that with anger? Um, maybe not anger. I tried to replace that with what I was hearing around me, which was, but it was your right. It was, it's your body. It's your choice. You weren't ready to be a mother. All of those words that at the time seemed very true. They are true. It might be true. However, that's not the bottom line. And that's not what this is about. It's not about that it's my choice or that it's my body. That wasn't my body. (laughs) And, and it isn't about my rights. It isn't about, it's about life and whose life are we talking about? And the child does not need to pay the death penalty for a decision that I made for me. That's, that's not right. That's not right. And that is the bottom line. So I didn't want to face that. So I, again, continued to surround myself with people and things and activities that reinforced the decisions I'd already made. Um, So remorse came, it was interesting because I I rededicated my life a few years down the road and um, really started growing in my faith, my understanding and my relationship with Christ. And a friend of mine said, will you go with me to this abortion recovery place? Because that night I had asked for forgiveness. I had met God on that, on that hill and I had given it to him and he had taken it. He had completely done it. I didn't, I didn't, there's nothing more I could have done. He did it and I accepted it. We were good. Um, what I didn't understand that there's, there were things that I still hung on to. That's the difference. And so he did it, but I didn't let him have all of it. So she said, will you go with me? And I said, sure, I'll go with you. Cause I'm fine. I don't need it. You know? And so I went with her. She want to go alone. And we went to one of these like eight to 10 week groups and you work through the process of everything. much like what I do now with women. And I was blown away by what I hadn't dealt with mm-hmm. me personally, which had blocked me from being useful in God's hands. Like I wasn't going to go tell people I had this experience, although I had given it to him, it was still, you know, mm-hmm. kind of private. Um, and so it's not useful if I can't be useful in that way for him. It's a secret. Well, mm-hmm. secrets don't help. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, he worked on that and worked through me and um, a lot more healing happened because I let him have it and uh it's he changed it all together so yeah i guess remorse remorse came when i kind of rededicated my life started thinking about that and really looking at what had been my decisions how i'd been living started to change those things draw some hard lines and Mm -hmm. look at what happened Um, and then when i when i finally was honest about it a lot of stuff changed well did you find um that any of your friends that you were around, even at the time, did you find that any of them expressed remorse? You said you were surrounding yourself with people. Mm-hmm. Who... Yes. It's almost like, you know, when you have to take medicine, it's going to be terrible, but I got to do it. I mean, that still was the part of the people around me. So one very good friend of mine, and you would think it would have tipped me off, but, but I already knew it, it, there's no secret. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that as I walked into the pregnancy center to get a pregnancy test, I didn't know 
that I was already planning on an abortion, whether or not they gave it to me, right? So this was a pregnancy counseling center. I went with two of my friends, one who had had a couple abortions and she knew the location for the pregnancy test. The other one, and for where to get the abortion done, the other one had just gone through her second abortion. And as we walked in and we sat in this little room with this lady who, and they weren't trying to promote it because they thought it was right and all. They were hurting. I mean, it wasn't a good thing, but here, this is what you have to do. That's really what it was. A lot of times people who are on the other side of understanding it and have been healed from the process, don't use the words that was a choice. They, they understand that it's a lot of times an unchoice. Now that wasn't my circumstance. I totally chose that for myself, but many women, they don't feel there's an alternative. Right. And so they don't have an option other than this choice. And, and it's sad. That's very, very, very common. So we're sitting there and this little lady at the pregnancy center where they don't do abortions, they'll do, it was a pregnancy counseling center. And, um, she looked at me and, uh, so we will give you the test. We want you to sit in this room and they watch, watch a little movie about what happens when you have an abortion. It wasn't oh, graphic, but it was literally, here's the doctor. These are the tools. This is what's going to happen. And I remember snippets. I, I was just so like mm-hmm. wearing a mask. I just was like, I'm not present. As I'm sitting there, my friend who had just had an abortion is losing her mind. She's crying. She's, oh. you know, sobbing. And I'm like, you're okay. You're okay. Like I disconnected because I couldn't have handled it. And inside me, I knew that it's, you know, we, we have such a propensity. God made us with ways for us to, to survive. Right. And, and whatever defense mechanisms, whatever you want to call them. But I, in me knew if I really faced what was happening, I would lose it. I wouldn't be able to do this. And I had to do this. Right. So Mm -hmm. I separated from that and yeah, she was a mess. She since found healing. Both of them have, and they're amazing Christian women, and I, I, their stories are just as powerful in their lives. But at the time, they were well-meaning. They wanted to help me do what I was saying I wanted to do. Yeah, and they I have said, to do. Okay, I know how to do it. Right. So, yes, I was surrounded by people at that time when it happened. It wasn't like the voices of choice and all. It was mostly my voice and people that were trying to be loving and kind and helpful. And then after the fact, when I couldn't face, that was what I did. And the, the, just the grotesque nature and the violence and the decision that I made, I couldn't face that. That's when I chose to continue to surround myself with people tickling my ears with those things mm-hmm. and if reinforcing that in my life and me growing in strength in that perspective, because that's what I was a part of. So without thinking for myself. I didn't, I knew better that if I did, that would change. Right. I, I wasn't ready to acknowledge it. So, um, you can find whatever you want. I think you're, you're stepping into something here that is super important that so often, I think in our society, people feel I've done this. This is my label now because I've done this, or I've been involved in this lifestyle and I can't change what's happened to me or what I've done. So I've just got to find ways to cope. And if you tell me anything else, you're trying to say I'm bad. Or I'm useless anyway. Like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Why do I bother? Because I'm damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You know, that kind of phrase, which is, couldn't be further from the truth. No, God really does have healing for broken hearts. And that is the other part of my journey when I realized that I didn't have to live in that place sort of juggling my justifications and dealing, you know, carrying this understanding or the lack of it, having to live in a place where I couldn't really look at reality. That was not being really alive. That was not being free. That was not being awake. That's just the opposite of, of the design that God made for me, whatever that might be, this is not it. And so to understand that when you're broken, it doesn't surprise God. When you make a poor decision, he's not surprised. Like, oh, shoot, I didn't know she was going to do it. He's aware of that. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. difference is when I bring that to him and I acknowledge it, he says, give me that, i got to fix it. And he transforms it into something completely different. That's where you get the phrase beauty for ashes. That's yes. exactly what that is. And, and only he can do that. Only God could take something so horrible, so anathema to the very purpose of being a woman i have the 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 honor and the ability to grow life in me 
-hmm. but to go against that very thing and destroy life is can kill you it can take you apart Mm -hmm. whether or not you realize it that's the deep-seatedness of this so when you whatever it is you bring bring he doesn't say come to me perfect he says come to me when you're bring it to me bring your brokenness bring your trash bring your drunk Mm -hmm. let me have it and i will transform that and he Mm -hmm. truly does it and sometimes women come before they're destitute in that place they get it sooner the sooner the better i love it when a 16 year old will give me a call or reach out or come i'm like thank you you're not going to waste 30 years of your life Mm -hmm. you're you're doing this now wow what a difference but sometimes it takes longer for women and then, and then they come. But it doesn't matter. You came at 50, you came at 70, you walk through this, you let God have this. It doesn't make any difference. And, and one woman that stands out in my mind, um, and we're still in contact. She's a wonderful lady. She, was, she fought some of the things we did. We do some activities throughout the class just to draw that out, to draw out the object lesson a little bit more. And it was so, some of she, she couldn't believe it. And she said, after we did this particular activity, she said, I wanted to stand up on my chair and say, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, well, you did it. Then she's like, I know. And I did it. And on this side of it, on this side of letting it go, on this side of understanding and letting God have all of that, she said, if I had done this 50 years ago, I would have had to go through this counseling and that counseling and the other counseling and the other thing, because all I needed was God to give him the root of my problem. Mm-hmm. Because it's just this insidious like vine that mm-hmm. tangles into so many aspects of life that women don't realize and one of the goals of this ministry of this of this recovery group thing that i am part of is to help them draw connect the dots and understand a little bit about like i'm not crazy this is not you know i'm not supposed to be living like this I'm not supposed to hide. so anyways that was a, a a great thing but that was her surprise like wow mm-hmm. if i just follow through so no matter the junk that you bring Mm-hmm. we can't be afraid to give that to him if he wants to take it well this is such a touchy topic especially now i mean it's yes. always been a touchy yes. topic it's like you know just one drop and it's wildfire yes um how have you handled the hate the judgment that comes your way uh thankfully there hasn't been that much i mean it's whatever i don't post things to public a lot of times it's usually people who know me and follow me not all of them agree with me but Mm -hmm. you know a friend might do something and someone and then some person will come on and disagree and make a point and and, um it's kind of two-sided one is the person who's fighting for that perspective because they're looking at it it's not their experience but they think abortion you can't tell someone not to have it. They don't understand mm-hmm. the How bottom How dare you line. take away their right? Right, and, and mm-hmm. I would never choose it, but I can't tell someone else. And so they, so in that perspective, I would explain life's value, all life, mm-hmm. any age. It doesn't matter. You were once a little thing. Like it's, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they could argue that. And there was somebody that, that went back, you know, went, went back and forth on that. Um, and she didn't want to, you know, she was arguing when life's a life. I said, I'm not, I can't tell you what to believe. I can tell you what science shows us. I can tell you what the Bible says, which doesn't matter to you because that's not where we're coming from. Mm-hmm. But you can't deny that it's destruction of a living thing, whether it looks like a person or not yet. It, it is. That's the definition of life. It's growth and change. And it's changing from the first second. Mm-hmm. Birth happens a little down the road, but it changes from the moment of conception. It is not the same two things it is now one thing and you can see that you can literally see that under a microscope if you don't believe me go watch it it's there mm-hmm. so anyway so the one hand is trying to help somebody who chalks it up to a political or a, or a woman's right to understand that this is not what we're talking about when we talk about right. abortion and the other hand it's the, the hurting woman who's fighting to remain sane and um and I, I have people I know very dear to me who are still in that fight. And it's a, it's a daily hit my knees. It's a, but if there is an opportunity for conversation, it's got to be full of compassion and understanding. And that's where I'm mm-hmm. thankful for what I have been through. Had I not experienced that, and there's women who work with this ministry who haven't been abor- through abortion, but they have a heart for what's going on so they can come compassionately. But it's a different right. level when it's something you understand. And all of the pushback I can answer. Because I had that pushback, and I, we can have a conversation lovingly, but I'm, I'm going to be honest. 
but I understand where they, so that's, that's a blessing. I'm thankful for that because I wouldn't be able to do that without having gone through it. Just like, you know, 10 years ago, we went, I, I lost a baby. We went through a miscarriage. Did I love that? No, I did not love that. But am I thankful for that? Yes, because that's one more layer of hurt that accompanies a lot of women who have been through abortion. It's one of the things that can be a possible physical side effect of having had abortion, one more, whatever, that I understand that pain and I understand and I can speak to that. Thank you, God, for making me more useful. It's not fun, I don't know, but I'm thankful for it. And I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it. If that was why I had to go through it, glory be to God. And and I'm okay with that. Okay. There was a book you shared with me. Gosh, it must have been 10 years ago, maybe. And it, I can't even remember the name of it right now, but it was from the viewpoint of women who had been raped or victims of incest. Victors and victims. So often is that is called. that, that, what was it? Victims and victors is what it's called. Right. And the premise being, you know, so many times that's that last ditch effort yes. to justify. Well, but if it's been put on them, how can you possibly mm. blah, blah, blah. Can you talk about that perspective a little bit? I can. So I found that very transformational to my way of thinking. Yes. As I navigated, okay, Lord, I understand that you want me to to speak against abortion. There's that gray area. There's that like, but what about, I mean, how can I tell? I've never been raped. I've not had experienced incest. How do I tell somebody who has been something through something so violent and so violating that they should stay pregnant and, you know, keep that reminder. We're told, you know, that it's compassionate to not make that woman right. have nine months worth of reminder of that event. And, and then a lifetime, if they keep that baby, you know, of the person that have violated them, you know, how, that's cruel. You shouldn't do that. I feel like, how do I answer that? I know I can't really speak right. to that. I just know it's wrong. I just know that God would never condone destroying another human being for the benefit of someone else. That's just not, that's not how God, all life is valuable. All life has, has uniqueness and is purposed. Mm -hmm. So this book was very helpful because it was basically a a gentleman that interviewed over 200 women, some in the category of having been raped, some in the category of having experienced incest. And it's their responses to the question Mm -hmm. when you got pregnant. Um, The women, as I remember, I haven't read in a while, I've, I've recommended to several people, but as I remember, the majority of the women who had been through the experience of rape that <clears throat> kept their child, it was very difficult. Obviously, it's going to be difficult, but they don't regret it. And after the fact, the blessing of having that child far outweighed what had happened in the purpose of, or, you know, with the experience of having it raped. Right. Um, and a lot of those women gave their child up for adoption they've gone through and they've healed from the, from the experience of the rape. And now they also know that they didn't have, they didn't, you know, put that debt onto someone else. They allowed that child the opportunity at love and at life because that child didn't ask to be conceived in that fashion. It's not the child's responsibility to take the, to make the payment for someone else's actions. So the women that had been raped that had, had gone through an abortion however one of them stands out and i'm gonna have to pull it out because i've been asked about this several times and i'll have it right in my fingertips but read the book read the book victims and victors um she explains that she went through the abortion and has since gone gotten past the experience of having been raped and, and being healed from that but cannot get past the abortion experience because what in effect you've done is you've been through someone has committed a violent crime you know, on you it's perpetrated that on you and you weren't innocent in that and you didn't ask for it but here's what's happened so when you then turn around and you abort your child you've now become just as violent a perpetrator to an innocent human being as what was done to you so that messes with your mind Mm -hmm. and this woman struggled at this point when she was being interviewed to address that appropriately she couldn't get past Mm -hmm. what that meant for her unborn child and what she had done and she was responsible for. So it's not really the compassionate answer because we think it's a, it's also sold as not we think, but it's sold as a, a quick, easy out, get your life back. And Maybe I can't tell you what happened. Yeah. I can't That's tell it. you what a big lie that is because mm-hmm. it, re, once you're pregnant, regardless of the outcome, whether you lose that baby, you give that baby up for adoption, you keep that baby, you abort that baby. Right. You are different because you have now had to consider 
another human being. You've been pregnant. You're different. You're changed. You can't undo that. Right. So whatever you do with that will affect you for the rest of your life. And abortion is not the easy answer. We say, get it done. Go back to, you'll never get your life back. Never. It'll never be the same as. Two wrongs you, won't make things right. No. And even if you keep the baby, you'll never get, it's, it's going to be different. That's where you ask yourself on the front end, is this something I need to be doing? Right. Uh, that's a whole nother topic, but responsibility for your actions is huge in the topic of abortion. And it is not birth control and it should not be taken lightly. Right. And a lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. You know, where's your responsibility in this scenario? Mm -hmm. Even if you stop thinking of yourself for nine months and allow somebody else the right to have a life and to be loved, even if it's not by you. Right. Right. So, yeah. Uh, did I answer the question? Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know what the yes. whole question was, but. You answered but that book, answered that book. Well, icing and a cherry on top. It was perfect. The other part of that was the people who had been victims of incest mm -hmm. and the idea that that's atrocious. Why would you keep that child? Why would you tell that girl she has to go through that pregnancy? And the majority, like the summary of the women who've expressed their experience with that was that imagine you're in a scenario with somebody who's raping you on a regular basis or abusing you in some fashion like that and you get pregnant and you get an abortion, what does that do for you? That puts you right back into that same scenario exactly. continuously. You have no out, and that's that's a way to cover up the the indiscretion to right. nobody will ever know. Yeah. You're a continual victim. You have no opportunity for anyone to know about that. However, if you get pregnant and you don't go have an abortion and everybody has to know, it ends because somebody is aware of it. And then what this woman's words were like, I can actually do something right. I can love this. You know, it was a, it was a way to make right out of something horrible for this particular woman that I'm remembering in my mind, but also to es escape that situation because you can't hide that mm -hmm. and it has to end. Now everybody's circumstances are different, but I, I did um, find that heartbreaking when they would talk about, you know, a young girl goes in and she's either been, you know, abused by a pimp or whatever, or mm -hmm. the incestual thing. And they're forced to, and then the agency that is yes. doing the abortion just goes along with it. And yeah, they are prolonging that agony. They are yeah. complicit is, in crime, in my Which is illegal, like you said, they're complicit in crime. And that's a different topic as well. But there are many, liveaction.com has a, has a whole set of undercover video interviewing things that they have done with Planned Parenthood phone calls, even, you know, people setting that up, anything from racial i want to put money just on black abortions oh sure no problem too um hey i'm a pimp you know i want to say a pimp but somebody came in pretending to be a a sexual boss and you know he has a girl who's pregnant who's underage but you know can i bring her in and the gist of that conversation was well sure bring her in and he's like well how long will it be before she can work and the comment is well she doesn't have to work just above the waist or below the waist so Wow. What is this? And that's illegal. When you understand, if you know that there's trafficking happening or an overage, you know, underage girl being abused by somebody overage, you are, as a human being, I would hope, but also as a citizen, <laughs> obligated to protect that child. That child. You no, know, it's about the dollar. It's about mm -hmm. the money. All day long, it is blood money. And it's, it's that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And they do a good job of of income gathering <laughs> yes they prey on the weakness if you could go back and give counsel to the young rachel what do you wish you could tell yourself like it 12 years and on um part of me says i would want to tell her you know understand the value of your sexuality understand the gift of of intimacy that you've been given mm -hmm you you have that to share and you should care enough about the person that you want to be with that's the bond that unites you in that special way don't give it away don't cheapen it don't do that um of course that's what you would want and that's what i pass to my children i try to explain that to them mm -hmm. in more detail than i understood it um but i ultimately end of the day can't make their choices for them and then i look at the other flip side of that coin and i see what god has done with my poor choices what he's done with my good choices, but what he's done with my poor choices even mm -hmm. more. And the fact that if I hadn't gone through that, I hadn't made decisions to, to compromise myself, 
or to get pregnant and have abortion or have to go through that process of the pain and the, and the agony and the healing, then the last 20 years of me being able to be used in that way wouldn't have happened. And I'm thankful for that. So it's kind of a, it's not an absolute what I would go back and tell myself. Right. I wouldn't want to go through that, but I'm thankful for having gone through that mm -hmm. because of what God has done with it and how he's grown me and who I am today. If you would have told me 20 years ago, I'd be on a bandstand telling people about abortion and how to get recovery from that and what it really is. I would be like, you are out of your mind, but that's yeah. what I do. And I'm so happy to be doing it when I'm doing it. It's, it's not because of me. So mm -hmm. That's a hard question, you know. I could say the right, you know, the good answer, and then the one. <laughs> well, no, it's the answer that's right is what's true, and yeah. Um, yeah. I love what you do, and I think it shows such an amazing ability of God that He truly does turn our weaknesses into our greatest strengths Absolutely. if we will allow it. If we bring yeah. to Him who we are, don't get under the shame, the guilt, the fear, the right. condemnation, right. all of that. Um, just real quick, I'd like for you to tell me maybe one of your favorite stories of redemption that you've seen in these years of working in this ministry. Um, gosh, there's so many. So the one that comes to mind mostly. So when a woman goes through abortion or initially comes to mind, uh, there's a lot of ways that that affects her life and not everybody deals with, you know, it can affect relationships with future boyfriends and spouses, it can respect relationships with future children, you know, it can affect your femininity, it can affect um, just a whole host of ways that you function or dysfunction moving forward. And so we, there was this young, early 20s girl who came and she came in beautiful face and just scrubbed and unattractive hair and just a big old sweatshirt, sweatpants and combat boots, just kind of hiding in her clothing and hiding in who she was and come to find out over time, um, she would have been very desirable. Somebody probably would have said, you're beautiful. I want to date you. But she did not. She had so closed herself off to all of that because she did not even want to be in the position to consider a relationship because she didn't want to ever, she didn't have to deal with what had happened in her life, what she had chosen. And so she just said, I'm never going to date anybody. I'm not going to get married. I'm going to be, never have children. And she was very uh, hard, hard hearted about those things. Right. And so through the process of the 10 weeks where we broke down some walls and we walked through everything from anger, depression, forgiveness, the whole nine yards. Um, who is Christ in this picture, right? What does God mean in this? How does healing happen? What is this about? It started, it just unfolded just like a beautiful, literally like just watched her layers just fall away and she would, come to love herself the way God made her to be again. And it was just so beautiful because again, over 10 weeks, you're not perfectly done. Of course, it's a lifetime of growing. It's a lifetime of learning and, and walking in a different pattern, mm -hmm. but it was it within 10 weeks, there is a notable difference. And I see it every time I always tell these ladies, I'm going to take a Polaroid at the very beginning. Don't be scared. Cause I'm going to take another one later and I'm going to give them both to you, but I want you to see the difference. We don't, but that's how I always want to do that. Um, so by the end of our group, she had told us about one of her best friends who was a, knew her brother and, and was, he's just such a good, good guy and did not come at her in any way, shape or form that she could tell was any interest. Um, but he was there alongside her, supporting, praying for her, loving her as a friend. He came to our memorial. We met him. It was platonic. She was still, you know, looking a little bit, <laughs> a little bit closed off, but much, much better. Well, come to find out within a year later, we get this follow-up information about, oh, so-and-so, you know, we're, we actually are dating now. And, you know, and I see her and she's this beautiful, she's taking care about herself. She, she's enjoying the way that God made her, the way she looks. She's caring about presenting an appearance that's peaceful. And she's not hard anymore. She's open. She's soft. She's loving life. She's enjoying freedom. She's looking like a woman. She's behaving like a woman. So then they get married. They now have three children. And she was so excited. She invited us to her wedding. So we went. And I remember her sitting there saying, she couldn't wait till after when we all went out and, and talked to him. And she, went, she like lifted up her wedding dress and showed me her shoes because she had these beautiful little heels on, you know, which I'd never seen her in anything but boots and sweatpants and, a boot, you know, all that. She's like, look, look, I wear, you know, she was so excited to just love being a woman. And not be afraid to experience all the things that come with that. And that's just, you know, 
it's sweet to see God re rewire, <laughs> which is an analogy that I like to use with, but it's kind of like the wires in the wall, the blue and the orange, they're all like this. And we're made, we're made to be emotional. We're made to be empathetic. We're made to enjoy. That's part of being a woman, all the different levels, of course, but that's part of, we're different from men in that way. And when that's all twisted and uh, we can't really express and experience life like we're meant to for ourselves and for others. So he straightens out those wires and we can then feel love and cry and laugh and enjoy like he made us to. And I watched this happen in her and it's just been such a beautiful thing. It was amazing to see. And it's still great. I see her on Facebook and her family and her kids. And I just, Aww. it thrills me every time. So I think, oh. <laughs> I'm so happy and so happy. So, so, awesome. Yeah, so it's beautiful. So I just want you to tell people how they can get in touch with you, how they can maybe get involved or pray for your ministry. Um, what's the best way for them to reach out? Um, obviously, praying for the ministry is wonderful. Um, it's where I, it's, it's something that's more and more available a lot of places. It's not just through the where I do this, but I, I volunteer at the SCB Pregnancy Center and I run their post-abortion ministry over there. Um, and I, there's some other women that do that with me. And, um, and there's women that do this. There's a woman that does it at Shepherd of the Hills. It's not really the same thing, but it's the same thing. We were, we started that together. So it's an arm of that. I mean, there's several of those things available. Church on the Way has something. So I would just say, if you are, there's another great resource that's all online that I just, um, connected with the woman who does it. Her name is Sydney Massey and it's called her choice to heal.com. And if you go there, there's, uh, it's basically what I do, but it's all on your own, which there's a huge bonus to the group environment for this. I agree. That's yeah. how it's designed. But to be honest in our day and age, especially with the COVID business and people can't, you know, we are doing groups, but people aren't always willing to come. So right. it's, it's something available if you want to get a first take a look at it and start walking through the process it's online and you can do it one module at a time and you can walk through that at least it opens the door it starts you yeah. thinking there's an assessment you can do do i even need help that's where i would start but that's a resource or you can contact the scb pregnancy center if you just typed it in and looked it up there's a phone number and if you call and you say you're interested in post-abortion recovery they will give your phone number directly to me and i will contact you um you can also email me if nothing else, if you just want to talk or ask some questions, it doesn't mean you're signing up for something. It just means that you, you want, you want to talk about this. You want to ask some questions and you, and I'm happy to hear and happy to pray with you. I'm happy to listen. Mm -hmm.